Okay, so um, similar topic. <laughs> I think it's the same. Uh, so, okay, so um, I started, it's kind of nice, just of our own free will. He ended his presentation with our trip, and I started mine with it, so it's very uh, connected. I went to, um, I actually flew to uh, Latakia, from which we drove to Tartus. This is the city of Banyas, uh, which is between the two, obviously. And um, I just wanted to notice that this is, the Syrian Arab army is there guarding the people so that they can uh, vote and feel safe. And you might notice in this picture, and I have another one, that the people are mingling very comfortably with uh, the military. And uh, the reason for that is because the military in that country right now, they are totally dependent on them for security. And this part of the country, although when I chose to go there, I was thinking, you know, they always say, uh, this is the Assad stronghold and so on. But actually, Latakia is very close to, um, very close to Turkey, borders on Turkey. There's a lot of resources here, and it's been a strong uh, stronghold also that the uh, rebels have attempted to uh, take over, and they're only recently been um, safe and free. And uh, so you see uh, they have a draft in Syria, which means that a lot of the military people, there's a lot of young people in the military uh, whose families live in these cities. And, um, who, uh, and so you see that the people in the military are not differentiated in the uh, government hold areas at the present. Um, here's just some people voting, and I tried to just get some personal shots. Uh, this guy was so cute. He's the um, person who controls uh, the person at the table is putting his vote in for him because he ha they helped him get it into the envelope, and he's like putting his hand over the top to make sure it goes in. And uh, here's the table where uh, activity is taking place. Uh, in terms of voting, you can see there's a crowd around it. And here this woman's having her daughter help her put the uh, ballot in because she wants her to know how important it is to vote. And for these people, this vote is really important. And uh, for the Americans, they'll say, well, it's just another referendum. But, and, uh, the Syrian uh, government claims, and it's true, they, they opened it up to more parties in the Ba'athists. But I think in this situation of war, in a way, it really was a referendum. And even so, it was really, really important to the people. And they're looking forward to a better future. Uh, so um, this is another voting place I went to. Um, this is a cement factory. And again, you see there's military people there and a long line of voters. And this is, uh, the, the lower shot is inside, uh, and the guy uh, with the big eyes on the right is a disabled vet who was there. And uh, he came through and everybody moved aside and then he was assisted to come up and uh, vote. And um, so this is just sort of how it was organized. It looks pretty familiar. It's not so different from ours except that there was so much enthusiasm of the people. Um, this is a refugee camp I visited in um, Tartus, and uh, the people there are from Aleppo, and uh, there are a lot of children around, and the people are staying, some in a school, and there's also like pavilions, like in a park, and the weather's pretty good when we were there, so they weren't too uncomfortable, but they're just under the pavilion with their sleeping bags and so on. And there's a lot of people, uh, the men are more likely to be outside, the women inside, but the children. And um, here's a bunch of the children uh, that were there. They all very excitedly greeted us. And uh, like the little boy over there was kind of uh, just bemused uh, at seeing these foreigners. And these two little girls watched as we were driving away, kind of wistfully. Uh, it's a hard time for them. And um, seeing foreigners come was very unusual for them. So, uh, but here is my friend, actually, in Iraq right now, Sarah Ahmed. She's on the uh, left. And um, this is a refugee camp in Erbil. 
And there are a lot of people there from uh, the part of Iraq that's been under attack by ISIS. And so essentially many of the same groups are attacking them. Um, and uh, Sarah's been posting on her blog because uh, she's been working there. She's, uh, prior to that, she's a dentist and she was working for a Christian charity in, in Baghdad. And uh, I might point out that she's a, a, her dad's a Sunni and I think she would probably self, uh, she'd probably self-identify as a Sunni, but her mother is Shia. So there's a very mixed uh, society in Iraq and in Syria. And uh, there's a lot of people who can't really identify uh, too strongly with any one group. Okay. So I wanted to talk about a few of the details of uh, underlying the story that Scott was telling. So one is I wanted to talk about water and drought. Uh, another is about oil and gas. Uh, the Sunni Shia competition and other ethnic and religious divides. Um, bad governance, oppression, um, ISIS, uh, terrorism, and then about U.S. intervention. Because these issues are all at play when you talk about the situation in Syria and Iraq. So in Syria, um, the loss of the Golan, this was a significant source of water that they lost back in the 60s, in the late 60s. And they actually tried to take it back in the early 70s and lost again. Um, that's the last time, to my knowledge, that they've attempted any kind of a war against anyone in the region. Um, also, Turkey controls the Ataturk Dam, which uh, is uh, just above, you know, maybe 100 miles north of uh, the border. And uh, they use that sometimes to control uh, Syrian water. And in the past, one of the things that's happened, it's, it's on the Euphrates River, which means it affects both Syria and Iraq. And one of the things in the past is, of course, if everybody's having a drought, Turkey solves their own problems because they don't have good, uh, a good ability to negotiate these things. Uh, it, even if it was one country, it might be better, but because it's three separate countries, they don't. And um, of late, they've actually been using the dam to uh, punish the Syrians. Um, there was a severe drought in uh, Syria in 2010, and uh, during that time, a lot of small farmers were put out of business, and there was a lot of discontent in the country. Now, Syria is, a, is still uh, more or less a socialist country, and the services they provide is uh, free education, the government provides these services, free education, uh, and free... Um, free medical care for everyone, and uh, a gas and oil subsidy, which they've sort of not been able to do so much of lately because uh, the uh, ISIS patrols their uh, um, oil, oil wells. And uh, they have a bread discount uh, that's kind of like a sliding scale, so no one goes without food. And uh, unfortunately though, if you're unemployed and you're angry because you lost your land, and you lost your uh, space in the scheme of things, that isn't enough. And uh, so the other thing is there's something called the Tabqa Dam, which only of late has been an issue because it's a dam in Syria and it's been, was first, uh, you'll see, I have the story, uh, a timeline further on, but was first under control of the rebels maybe in 2012 and then it went under ISIS control shortly thereafter. Um, Iraq, again, has problems because of the Ataturk Dam, and their big problems are mostly uh, just the consequences of war. They haven't had a government that's been able to really put things back together, and most areas still don't have clean, potable water. They still don't have um, access to the resources to rebuild. So um, this is really a, a major issue. And if you look at this picture, I took this out the window of the plane, and actually it's not as striking as some I took a few years ago in Iraq, which I couldn't find. Um, but it's a wasteland in the vicinity of the oil wells and in the eastern part of Syria and the western part of Iraq, which we're hearing so much about lately. There are people who live there, and there's the oil wells and their sources of income, but the surrounding area is, is just a moonscape. 
it's a severe desert, and especially since the droughts of the last few years. Um, Syria, uh, they told me that they have food independence right now and that they're afraid to be dependent on anyone. And where I was, this is how they're growing vegetables. These are uh, greenhouses, and they're just miles and miles of these greenhouses separated here and there by um, olive groves. And uh, these had tomatoes in them. I think you can see it. Some of them had corn and other vegetables I didn't recognize. Um, but essentially, they just have miles and miles, and they have to grow the vegetables in these greenhouses because of the drought, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to provide enough water to keep them alive. Um, so uh, these are just a few bullets uh, talk about oil and gas. Syria and Iraq share the region where there's a significant oil and gas resources. Uh, but this is not the best oil and gas area in the, in the region at all. It is uh, sort of the lesser area for Iraq. They have much better oil wells in uh, the north around Kirkuk and in Kurdistan. And they also have better, better oil wells around Basra, which they share the same pool kind of with Iran. So, but there are oil wells and they are being fought over right now. And um, Syria has never been really a big oil producer. They have some oil wells, but they've been under sanctions for a very long time, like decades. Uh, and so they've mostly been using them of late uh, to provide their own people with discounts of oil um, so that they can have cheap heating oil and cheap uh, um, cars. They can travel cheaply. Um, so as I just said, the area around these oil wells is a desert and it's not heavily populated. And I believe anyway that that's why prior to this most recent uh, uh, sort of spread of ISIS, Syria wasn't fighting very hard on that front. Um, prior to the war, uh, oh, okay, did that. Racks, best wells around Basra and Kirkuk. Okay, onward. Okay, the Syrian government includes a large bureaucracy, and demographically it's mostly Sunni. And that's because the population is mostly Sunni, and the bureaucracy reflects the population. The Syrian Arab army is composed mostly of Sunnis, uh, for the same reason. It reflects the demographic realities of the country. Um, there are many Christians and members of other minorities in the Syrian government as well as in the Syrian population and in the army. The current head of the military is a Christian. The president is Alawite. Uh, but, like most large bureaucracies, it reflects the demographics of the country. So just that sort of uh, is something most people don't realize in Syria. Um, this is just the bureaucracy. It's a familiar sight, bureaucracy. This is the election board. Um, so um, there, we hear a lot about the ethnic and religious uh, conflict in uh, Iraq and Syria. So um, before the 2003 to 2010 war, Iraqi, Sunni, and Shia lived in peace with each other. Uh, it's true the Shia were mistreated, uh, as are the black people in the United States and the Native Americans and uh, sometimes Latinos. Uh, but that didn't mean that they were at war with the other people in the country. Uh, the Kurds were already protected uh, because since uh, 1991, the United States has put a protective barrier uh, between them and the rest of Iraq. Uh, and they do have a significant amount of regional autonomy. Uh, the Sunni and Shia often intermarried uh, and lived in the same neighborhoods in Iraq. Similarly, Muslims, Christians, and others lived in peace in Syria. And Syria, uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a very important thing to them. Uh, as part of their culture, that it, is in, that it is inclusive of diversity and that it honors diversity. And there's like, you know, all different sects of Christians there because Christianity started right there. And in fact, Lebanon and uh, Palestine were very much connected to Syria for most of the last couple thousand years. And they were very much, uh, like they speak the same dialects of the language, and they're very much uh, a part of uh, 
Syrian culture. And it's only in the last couple hundred years that that changed due to colonialism. Uh, so regional clustering of different uh, demographic groups was just more or less due to the historic roots of the population. Uh, and it should be known that Syria hosted the largest number of refugees from Iraq during the uh, U.S. war on Iraq. And uh, they treated them the best. They uh, allowed them to have medical care. They allowed the children to go to school. And uh, they generally, uh, it was one of the better places to go. And um, it also has the largest number of Palestinian refugees in the region, uh, which has uh, come to be seen uh, through some kind of problematic lenses since there's been a war there. But like the, they, they built their own areas up, what started out as refugee camps became communities where Syrians moved in and Palestinians moved out. And uh, they weren't wealthy communities, but they were communities that blended with the rest of the society there. Uh, so just to mention, there are many in, in both countries, indigenous Azeris and Christians and Assyrians, Armenians, Kurds, Turkmen, Yazidi, Druze. Many of them are Muslim sects, but some are Christian. Uh, and uh, that is the nature of the region. Uh, and I might mention, before I move on, that there were a lot of Jews there, too. And after Israel came to power, and they had a lot of, uh, they had a number of little wars between 1948 and 1974 or 3, whatever it was, when the last one was, with, is between Israel and Syria. And Israel was always inviting the Jews to come and live there. And in many cases, they offered them money and homes and other resources which uh, caused them to move just to get out of poverty. And I actually uh, saw some uh, interviews of people who said that, who said that they left and they went to Israel or to Long Island because they were offered, you know, a house and $50,000 to get started uh, back in the 60s, say. Um, so anyway, my next uh, sources of discontent. There are real sources of discontent in the region. And uh, in Syria, it had to do with the drought and poverty. Um, something that is very hard for a government that's isolated by sanctions to solve. And uh, it's also hard for a government that's, uh, you know, uh, what did I want to say? Oh, that has to deal with the IMF. Because again, they have, you know, then they have to not hand out so many freebies to these people. And these people are certainly not going to get on the IMF gravy train anytime soon. Um, there is a lack of political freedom. Everybody knows that. Um, but I would say that to the people at large, maybe not to some of the people, but to the broad expanse of the population, uh, it has been a lesser issue to the issues of poverty and frustration with their place in society. Uh, and there's a desire by assorted factions to fight for power. And this is true both, as we know, in Iraq and in, um, in uh, Syria. And as uh, Scott was saying, there are Americans on the ground in these co countries, not to mention also in Ukraine, in Poland, in Ro Soviet Russia, everywhere. There are American uh, NGOs on the ground preaching political freedom as the ultimate reality in life. And I always find that kind of interesting because I don't think we have it because we don't pick our candidates any more than, say, the people of Iran. Uh, we vote for whomever we're allowed to vote for. So um, anyway, so Iraq, the country is totally destroyed. There's a dysfunctional government that we left behind that we helped to choose. And uh, it's incompetent. And it's not uh, being very fair, but it's not being competent to begin with. Uh, they're not being, they're not uh, able, they haven't been able to do much restoration within the country. Only the richer areas have been restored, and that's because they have money there. So like say around the oil wells in Basra, or in Najaf and Karbala where they get a lot of money from Iran, there's been more restoration. But the Sunni areas, they don't have a, a really a source of money. And the Iraqi government has basically been fighting with everyone about the oil 
trying to get a better deal and therefore not getting anything initially. Um, okay, ethnic and religious understanding. So, uh, as I said, Syria is ethnically uh, and religiously very diverse. Uh, there's a lot of, someone corrected me, I used the word tolerance. There's an embracing of diversity there. Uh, Syria and Iraq, especially in the cities. Syria and Iraq uh, both have uh, our historical beginnings of all the religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, they both have had secular governments for at least a century. Um, there is a difference, which is that Syria has had a stable government for the last uh, 50 years, or no, that's too long, mm -hmm. since I guess 1970-ish, so for the last 30, 40 years, 45 years. And um, Iraq has been totally destabilized over and over in, in, in the last 10 years. Uh, it's just all the social infrastructure has been destroyed. And Sarah said when she first went back to uh, Baghdad, she kept going to all these uh, ministries and saying, what can I do? How can I help? There's this very educated person. She's a dentist. And people go, well, we'll get back to you. We can't figure it out yet. You know, and they really were completely incompetent. So this has been a big problem in Iraq. Um, some issues uh, related to the Civil War. Uh, I'm going to put these out there. Uh, not everyone uh, believes this, I know. And I have some pretty good sources if anybody wants my link list. I'm happy to share it. Um, there were the, some of the problems were that uh, the, S, the Syrian National Council and the Free Syrian Army were never integrated with each other. So we had a military force on the ground. Uh, they had no connection, whatever, with the force that was being suggested as a government. Um, the Free Syrian Army was never integrated with each other, and it was rapidly infiltrated by foreign fighters. Uh, the Syrian National uh, Council, or whatever it was, they changed its name, and I can't remember which it was, uh, has no direct relationship with the Syrian people. And an interesting thing about that, I kept thinking about it during the election when Americans were saying this isn't a democratic election because uh, Assad's going to win, because Assad's in it, basically. And um, I kept thinking, if the Syrian National Council members ran for election in Syria, how would that be democratic? The people never heard of any of them. They would be basically choosing among strangers, and you could say, well, they'll put forward their technocratic platforms, but how would the people have any idea of whether they would actually stick to them, of what their loyalties were? They would have no information about these people whatsoever. So that doesn't seem very democratic either. Um, then I say the Free Syrian Army was uh, initially empowered by outside assistance and then later overrun by it. And um, most recently, since uh, they became aware that they were overrun by it, uh, and since the Syrian uh, Arab Army has started having victories, which we'll see on a map soon, um, the, uh, a lot of uh, the government has made repeated offers to rebel fighters who are Syrian nationals that uh, if they change sides back to the government side, that they will allow them, that they will put them on the payroll. And in fact, some people who weren't fighting went, what? Those guys who were fighting against you were getting on the payroll? I need money too. Uh, but they were essentially taking them back because one of the ways that these people actually left and started fighting the government was that Qatar, was offering salaries uh, to anyone who uh, would fight against the Syrian government back in 2011 and 12. And so what would happen is, uh, here's a guy, he's unemployed, he's mad at the government, and uh, the, he's given uh, a situation where he can get a salary if he'll go to war against the government, and uh, the Americans say they guarantee he'll win. So um, more about oil and gas. Here's where I get to some of my uh, hard data. Reasons, uh, okay. As I say, I don't think the Syrians fought very hard on that front because it's not heavily populated. And by now, they've actually retaken most of the heavily populated areas, and they're working hard to retake uh, Aleppo. 
uh, but they'd be taking Homs and Hama and Suwait and most of the suburbs of Damascus. Um, oil and gas are not a good reason for starting a war there because they just weren't, and even with uh, what's under the Mediterranean, it's not the strongest feature of Syria. What's really going on with Syria is that they are the linchpin for the resistance in the Middle East. And uh, Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas use them as an exchange point for resources and uh, for political support. And that's been true for a long time. Um, the oil and gas are very small for a small enterprise if they can get the resources they need to operate wells and refineries, because if you'll remember, we're told that ISIS is also operating refineries, both in Syria and Iraq. Um, in April of 2013, that was reported, and this was by uh, an oil industry uh, news outlet, it was reported that the EU ended sanctions against Syrian oil so that the rebels could operate these wells. Well, they needed parts, they needed assistance, whatever. So um, here's something I found just a few days ago. Um, I'm not sure why I saw that I included that first image, except to show that uh, Ambassador uh, Ford is related to John Kerry, which of course they're both in the State Department. And the middle picture uh, was, I'll give you the timeline in a minute, but that's Ambassador Ford with uh, General Abdul Jabari, who was uh, the person selected to uh, be the high guy, the top guy in the Free Syrian Army. And most of his job was distributing weapons and resources. And the last picture is General Abdul Jabbar uh, with a man who was not the Emir of ISIS, but an Emir of ISIS, who controlled the city of Raqqa for quite a while. If he doesn't still, I don't know. Uh, so you see these three connections, uh, Ambassador Ford with uh, John Kerry, Ambassador Ford with this Free Syrian Army guy, and then the Free Syrian Army guy uh, with ISIS. And this was, the two second two pictures are from videos, which I can uh, give the links to. And um, in the last picture, they're standing in front of a destroyed helicopter because uh, they just, um, took the airport outside of uh, Raqqa from the, uh, from the uh, Syrian Arab Army. So um, here's my uh, timeline, yeah. So in April, on April 23rd, 2013, there was a report that the EU lifted the sanctions on Syrian oil and U.S. Ambassador Robert Ford, that's the same day the picture was taken of Robert Ford uh, with uh, General Abdul Jabbar. So in August, so that's a few months later, uh, actually only a little over three months later, if you look at the dates, um, the ISIS leader, and that's when the picture was taken of, taken of the ISIS Emir and Free Syrian Army General Abdul Jabbar. They're celebrating their joint victory, uh, taking over a military air, airport uh, and base. Um, on the 10th of August, a couple days later, there was reports that ISIS and al Nusra were fighting with each other. Mind you, the Free Syrian Army was at this point allied with ISIS. Um, on the sixth, between the 16th and the 20th, uh, 16th of August and the 20th of September, there were all these very upbeat, happy articles about how ISIS is taking control of Raqqa, and they're, they're making the buses run. And um, they're going to be okay. They're going to be an okay government there. And um, I don't know what happened to the Free Syrian Army because on the 23rd of September, the Free Syrian Army General Abdul Jabbar quit and abdicated to Turkey because ISIS had just emptied his weapons cache and basically shut down his camp. So um, what we're hearing about ISIS is, you know, I, I feel like it's ambivalent, but I can't ignore the fact that when I read the reports in the Western news, many of them seem kind of backhandedly admiring of this group of people. You know, they're so competent. They're running oil wells they're, uh, and refineries. They're, they're robbing banks. Now they have money. Wow. 
And, um, you know, they're ruthless, something that Americans in many cases admire. Uh, that's, that's how, that's capitalism, ruthless. And so we're thinking, well, gee, maybe these successful guys should just be allowed to take over. So here they are. Um, this is after uh, a big battle where they beat the Syrian army in, uh, outside of um, uh, Aleppo. Just like, I actually found the pictures and I thought they were old, but they're only a, a few weeks old, a couple weeks old. They were brand new when I found them. See the heads of the soldiers on the poles behind them? See the guy down here? This is from the same group. And here they are, um, you know, freeing themselves of the excess people that they don't want. Uh, basically lined up in a pit, looks kind of like the Nazis. Um, but the heads, that's like a new, a new touch, I must admit. Um, would you want to be governed by these people? That's my question. You think that there's really anyone in Syria or Iraq who wants to be governed by these people? Even somebody who's a pissed off Sunni. You know, I don't think so. And um, interestingly, the, uh, the, um, this very important sort of group of uh, Sunni uh, elders uh, called the Islamic Scholars has recently, just in the last week or so, put out a very strong statement saying that they totally abhor what ISIS is doing and that no, no Sunni militants should support them and in Iraq this is because we heard new, you know, word that maybe the Sunni uh, and Sunnis in Iraq were so dissatisfied with their incompetent and uh, maybe uh, biased government that you know, but you know, I have to say, there's incompetence and bias, and there's this. So um, I wanted to talk some more about the oil, about this very competent thing these guys are doing. Do these guys look like somebody who could do a major engineering task? You know, operating oil wells and refineries requires advanced technological support. I, when I went to Pakistan, uh, I rode on a plane with a guy, and we struck up a conversation because I've been in Kurdistan. He was returning from Erbil, and where he is a contract engineer. They have many contract engineers in Kurdistan. That's how they got their oil up and running. They also have a college that's completely focused on, uh, on training people in geology and on engineering skills that are needed for um, running for operating oil wells and refineries. These are this is not a small thing, and um, I haven't seen any indication that these foreign fighters flooding into uh, Syria would have this uh, these skills automatically. And I'm not sure what kind of an engineer would go and work for them. They must have be getting them from somewhere though. And lifting the sanctions made that possible. The other thing they need is markets. And I would say that even the Kurds are struggling a little with selling their oil, so it does make you wonder how ISIS is selling theirs. Um, and then I have the Kurdistan example here, so I won't repeat it. Um, supposedly, though, the Kurds are our good friends, and we're not buying their oil, and uh, many of our allies are being asked not to. So, again, one has to wonder who exactly ISIS is selling their oil to. Um, here's a map. Um, of the area recently taken over by this group ISIS. In fact, they call them Jaish in, um, in Arabic. Um, one thing I want to say is that all this was controlled by a uh, combination of rebels and um, these uh, outside fighters, all this white area here, and it isn't anymore. Uh, so this, the Syrian army actually has retaken a great deal of Syria and when we hear scare stories, because ISIS is controlling this, we have to keep in mind that although there are significant resources there, uh, there's not, it's not the most densely populated. And the most scary thing to me is Mosul. And it's also true that, um, let's see, next map. Okay, uh, this is the way it was a while ago, and it just shows you that the Syrian army has retaken a lot of this area there. They didn't control at the time this map was uh, put out. Um, here's another picture, which, why is this interesting? Because this shows what ISIS really controls when you see that big glob. This shows the habitable areas and the roads. 
that they're controlling without, you know, sort of globbing in everything around them. Um, and here, uh, this shows ISIS, what they say they're going to take over. And it's interesting that this is in a U.S. Uh, study of war area. And what's interesting is that all these white areas are now contested, and ISIS has claimed that they're going to take them over. Jordan, Lebanon. Well, they haven't threatened to attack Israel. Israel is still running hospitals in the Golan to take care of the fighters. Um, but, uh, and they've been fighting with the Kurds in here, and the Kurds have taken serious losses. And one thing that concerns me is that I just saw today that in one of the Kurdish papers, they said the Americans have offered to support them, that they've been asking the Americans for support in this fight. And although the Americans said no to the Iraqi government, they're going to say yes to the Kurds. Now, it isn't finished yet because we haven't seen the Americans say it. But uh, Rudolph, the magazine that said that's pretty, uh, usually pretty accurate. Um, so uh, how is the U.S. intervening? Well, uh, Scott went over a lot of this, but direct involvement to create a civil war in Syria following the destruction of Iraq. Uh, Ambassador Ford was definitely working with the people who eventually became the rebels there. It's also true that al-Baghdadi, the guy who runs ISIS, was in a U.S. prison in Iraq until we left. And shortly after we left, he was released and ISIS emerged. So it was a very short turnaround. And if you remember, uh, they had special cells in Guantanamo for the guys that they were training to lead uh, some of the terrorist organizations to do U.S. bidding. And uh, they were indeed released. Um, We've been supplying weapons to all sides in Iraq, uh, to anti-government forces in Syria, oops, in Syria, including ISIS and al-Nusra, and, and certainly Seymour Hersh's article talking about how, uh, about the rat line from Libya is a pretty telling. Uh, so, uh, and we've been helping ISIS finance through oil and sources of weapons. They, they got the weapons cash from the Free Syrian Army in Syria. And I'll, I won't even make a statement because I know people have said, well, you can't say that's on purpose. It's not our fault if they uh, got our guy. You know, and then in Iraq, they just got all those weapons that, um, not just the Sunnis, because I read an article again in Ruda by this uh, Kurdish uh, general in the Iraqi army, and he said that his group was not supplied with weapons because they were Kurds and they don't trust them. And he said that uh, the Sunnis had already abdicated and run off weeks before ISIS took over. So the only ones left were the Shia. You would have thought they would have really wanted to fight ISIS, but for some reason their generals walked away. And so the men on the ground didn't know what to do. Because why would you leave your weapon? Why would you leave your weapon when you're trying to escape a vicious, opponent. You know, you would think you would carry it with you and try to protect yourself, but they didn't. And uh, that picture of the uh, men lined up with guns and the other guys in the trenches, that was what happened because they left their weapons. Um, but at any rate, all those weapons are now in ISIS hands and that's really one of the reasons why they're kicking ass with the Kurds and the Syrian army, uh, because they have superior weapons now, they have the American weapons. Um, U.S. has been supported, so I don't care if you think it's an accident or if, if you think it's deliberate, we're still supplying their weapons. Uh, and we're talking about uh, Obama wants to give another $50 million worth of weapons to the Free Syrian Army, who pretty much everybody agrees has been beaten into such disarray between the uh, jihadists, the jihadis, Talk theories on the one hand, and the Americans on, or in the uh, Syrian army on the other hand, that they really cannot, there's no way that they can uh, be responsible for the support that we give them unless we also put some people with it, which so far they're not willing to do. Um, and finally, the U.S. is complicit for hiding the truth about what's happening there. Um, so why Syria? As I said before, uh, Scott gave a lot of reasons, but I think the main reason is because they're the center of regional solidarity. 
And um, why Iraq? Well, they have the oil wells. And they are a contested space between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is our ally. Finally, uh, a disorganized Iraq creates a lot of liabilities for Iran, Syria, and Turkey, and an advantage for Saudi Arabia and the Gulf monarchies, who are our consistent uh, allies. Um, this is um, uh, Hassan Nazarallah of Hezbollah. People will often compare him. They'll use the same language to describe him as uh, the guy who has ISIS. They, they, Hezbollah has never uh, fought with anyone else except for Israel until now it's supporting the Syrian army in Syria. And what this is, you can watch the whole video if you want to, it's on my uh, blog. But uh, the whole video isn't his whole speech either, he's a big talker, he's a politician. Um, he doesn't run for office, but as a, a leader, he's a, a, a politically minded and, and uh, he um, it's just the part where he's explaining why he feels, this was last spring, why he feel, felt that Hezbollah had to go in and support the Syrian army. And what he says is, uh, if the Takfiri tri terrorism triumphs in Syria, we will all be eliminated. And since then, they have said that Lebanon's on their next, their next stop in Jordan. Uh, he says, not just the party, Hezbollah, or the resistance, all of us, will be eliminated. He said, don't you see what's happening in Aleppo, Idlib, Raqqa, and Fallujah, and Anbar? Ask, don't ask the secularists, ask the Islamic parties in those areas about what had occurred to them. He says, and if the Takfiri terrorist movement is defeated in Syria, then we will all remain. In other words, nip it in the bud if you want to survive. Whatever Sunni, uh, just malcontents and, and rebels, so to speak, are, are still on the field. There aren't many that would support ISIS, and in fact, they tried to fight them, and they're losing, because they don't even have decent weapons. At least the Kurds and the Syrian army has a reasonably uh, decent weapons to fight them. Uh, so uh, what should we do? This is what I think. We should stop our government from funding and facilitating terrorist organizations like Israel and ISIS. Organizations that murder people whole, whole hog to get their way. Uh, we should stop our government from using sanctions to undermine legitimate governments at the expense of the people. And when I say a legitimate government, they may not be your favorite. But the people of that country, by and large, uh, have chosen them. And the people, uh, and so that's not our choice. You know, someone could decide for us. I know that the majority of Americans don't like our government, but would we want someone to come and start bombing us yeah. to change it? Yes. Um, we should stop meddling by our government to secure Western interests at the expense of indigenous peoples. We should educate ourselves about the difficult choices faced by foreign peoples and their governments. We should respect the lives, the values, and the decisions made by other people in their own societies. And we should abide by international humanitarian law and human rights law. And then we can hold the others accountable who break those laws. 